Our first speaker tonight is sponsored by the National Security Education Program, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Radha Mihalcha. Dr. Mihalcha is the director of the Artificial Intelligence AI Lab at the University of Michigan. Now, don't get nervous. As language professionals, sometimes we think AI, uh-oh, it's going to replace language teachers. This is not the case. Uh, with Dr. Mahalcha, her research is extremely interesting in the area of computational sociolinguistics. So think about if you could figure out if someone is lying based on what a computer tells you. Think about if you could discern fake news on the internet. Think about what you could learn from a text about someone's emotions and sentiments. These are the areas that Dr. Mahalcha is investigating. Very important to us in terms of our society at large, but certainly important to our students. So I'm proud to introduce Dr. Radha Mahalcha, and we'll hear from her as our first Connect Talk speaker. Thank you for the warm introduction. I'm really pleased to be here. And I'm also here to tell you that AI is not to take our jobs. AI is to help us and just make us better. And what I would like to talk about today is a different side of how we can use AI to get better insights into ourselves. The jury is still out there as to how language came about. And yet, we seem to have reached an understanding as to what's the role of language. We use language to tell each other stories. We use language to share opinions. We use language to talk about the past or maybe make plans for the future. We also use language to tell lies and sometimes even use language to tell each other to stop using language. <laughs> what I'd like to argue tonight is that aside from communication, language plays another important role and that is to tell each other about ourselves. And by that, I don't mean necessarily the explicit information that we convey. I could tell you that my name is Radha Miharcha. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Michigan. But I will also tell you much more than that. And by the end of this talk, through my use of language, without explicitly telling you, you likely have an idea on whether I'm an introvert or extrovert, on whether I'm from around here or from abroad, and even get a glimpse into some of my beliefs and values and passions. Before I share some of the research that we've been doing together with students and collaborators into understanding this connection between language and people with the help of computational methods, I want to step back and go at the beginning of the 20th century to one of my favorite linguistic theories. Due to Safir Wirth is the linguistic relativism theory that puts forward that the language we speak would influence the way we think about the world. Here is an example from more recent work in linguistic relativism from Lera Boroditsky at the University of California at San Diego, where she brought people in the lab and asked them a simple question. What do you think about the sun? She brought some people who were native speakers of German. And asking them this question, of course, the answer were very diverse, but they converged toward words such as nice and warm. Then she also brought in speakers who were native Spanish speakers. And asking them the same question, they said things such as big and strong. Now, it turns out there is one difference. The word son in German is feminine. And so most of the common answers came back as more feminine descriptors of son, like nice and warm. Whereas in Spanish, that same word has a masculine gender. And so most of the descriptors were masculine descriptors, like it big and strong. So we wanted to, do, to explore this hypothesis further. For one thing, we relax the hypothesis. We don't ask necessarily whether people who speak different languages would think differently about the world, but rather whether people from different groups would think differently about the world. And those people could eventually even speak the same language, except that they belong to different groups, like different cultures, maybe different industries, different genders. 
And also, the other thing that we are doing, rather than focusing on a handful of words, which is what primarily people in psychology do, because they are limited by the number of subjects they can bring in, we can go big, because we can apply computational methods. So we can look at hundreds or even thousands of words. And that's what we've done. So we took data from blogs, and we focus on US and Australia. And taking blogs covering five different years, we took examples for 1,500 words. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. We have hundreds of thousands of blog posts. Some of them written by Americans, so this is the American view of these words, and some of them written by Australians, which represent their view. Now what we can do with this, we can start understanding whether there are differences in how these two groups of people use these words that we focus on. And here is one example. So here is the word travel. If you look at two examples that come from our data set, so one of them says, discover a beautiful patchwork of fishing, farming, and forestry activities by traveling to the region. Another example, have you guys ever tried dry shampoo? It's a lifesaver when traveling. Now it happens that you've already seen the answer. I would have asked you which one you think is by whom. Turns out the first example was written by somebody from Australia, whereas the second one comes from an American writer. So what we want to do is to see if we could use computational methods to uncover these differences. So we take, as I said, one word at a time and take thousands of examples for this word from these two groups of people. We convert them into a format that can be handled by computational methods. We refer to this as feature vectors, where we take individual words, we take syntactic relations, we take maybe some of the effect that these words would entail and so forth, and put them all in a list of attributes that are then fed to a machine learning system. Now with this, what we can do, we can see whether the machine can identify patterns that we distinguish between these groups. So for instance, for most of the words, there are no distinctions, and that's perfectly fine. It means that these two groups of people are using the words in the same way. But there are some words, about 400 words among the 1,500 that we explore, that have clear distinctions. One of them is the word travel, which you've just seen. For that word, we can tell apart the speakers, whether it's an Australian or American, with 70% accuracy. Which might not be very impressive at first. You say, well, 70% is quite a bit less than 100%. But it's also quite a bit higher than random choice of 50%. So that tells us that there is something into the use of this word that would a machine can pick on, and presumably humans would pick on too, to understand these differences between how these two groups of people would look at this particular concept of traveling. So with that, we can then also look at what are some of these differences, and how can we explain that this word is used differently by groups of people. There are different ways in which we can go about that. One of the ways that we've been doing is to try to narrow it to meanings. So we take a word, and then we look at what are other words that this word is associated with, and this will give us some approximations of meaning. Then we look at the distribution of these meanings for the two groups that we are considering and see which are the dominant meanings for one group versus the other. So here is an example of one of the words that we uncovered in our data-driven fashion. The word university, it turns out that is used quite differently by American and Australians. Now if you think just a little bit about university, my guess in this, this particular group, the words that will come to mind are things such as education, teaching, students, career, maybe research. And it turns out that's what Australians think about. So when they say university, this is the meaning that comes to mind. So there's a dominant meaning in the Australian view of university. Now in US, that's not the case. In US, we have a completely different dominant meaning for university, and that has to do with sports. So US will think of university, and again, this is not 
you and me, is lay people out there, the 200 plus million of Americans who write blogs, and their view of universities as an environment for sports. Now, so far, we looked at these differences between words by assuming there is some context. So we have a sentence that's spoken by a certain group, and based on that, we can start understanding whether they use this particular word to mean certain things, which may be different from another group. Now, what if we don't have that context? Can we somehow get to the semantic network that's inside our heads? And there, it turns out there is a nice way to approximate that, and that is through this game of word associations. So here we don't have any context, we just give what, have one prompt, and then we think of what is the first word that comes to mind. So as one example, consider this word, cat. The first word that comes to mind, if you think, probably would be dog. Right? So most people would come back with a strongly associated concept. Now, how about this word? So if I say, if I say sleep, so what is the first word that comes to mind? Now here, the agreement is a little less. If you ask people what's the first word that comes to mind in response to this prompt, and for that matter to other prompts, it turns out that there is a difference. So going back 100 years, there was a study by psychologists, Kent and Rosanoff in 1910, who asked the same question. And they asked these questions to groups of people of different ages and also different gender. So for the word sleep, the younger group, most dominant answer would be dream. Whereas for the less young group, most dominant answer is awake. <laughs> so we wanted to do the same thing and wanted to see if we could replicate some of this with computational methods. For one thing, this study sits in a big gray book. So if we wanted to turn them into digital format, we had to go about our own way of collecting data. And that's what we've done. So we turned to Mechanical Turk and asked for the help of thousands of contributors around the world. We gave them 300 prompts and get back more than 200,000 responses. Now these were asked from different groups. So we asked responses from Americans and Indians, and we also asked responses from male and female. So the kind of data that we go back it will be split into these four groups. And here is an example of the data that we collected. So one of the prompts is the word bad. And if we look at the most dominant answers coming back from American men, we get water. Now if we ask the same question, what's the first word that comes to mind for to, Amer to Indian men, the most dominant answer is once again, water. If we ask now Indian women, most common answer would be soap. And if we ask American women, the most common answer would be bubble. <laughs> So this is just one of the words in our data set, but you can get an idea of the kind of differences that you can see when you ask for the association between concepts in people's minds for different groups. So one of the things that we've done with the 200,000 plus responses that we have gathered is to look to what extent people would agree with their own group versus people from another group. So the way we can do this, we take one individual out of our data set and ask to what extent their answer would be in agreement with the top 10 from their own group versus the top 10 from the other group. And this is what we got with this analysis. So we see here the red columns would reflect the within group agreement versus the blue column are across group agreements. So if we take again the example of taking one individual what? Say if we take one response from an Indian, regardless of their gender, they would tend to agree with other people from India about 80% of the time versus 
looking at agreement with people from US, the agreement will be around 50% of the time, which tells us something about how different groups of people would form different kinds of these internal semantic networks. So what we wanted to do now is to see if we could use computational methods to get the same kind of word association. So once again, we reverted to a lot of data, blog that we collected written by Americans and Indians, again, hundreds of thousands of blog posts covering a wide range of years. And with this, what we can do is to start training algorithm that will learn representation for words. Now, one of the most common ways of doing that these days is through the use of neural networks. Neural networks are approximations of what we do. So they would have neurons, and these neurons would be connected to one another and pass information to one another. So one way we could use this neural network is to get them to learn representations for words. For instance, I could take a lot of examples for the word cat and look at what are the other words that occur in the context, and formulate it as a prediction task. So I say, if I see the words D, sat, and mat as my input, can I predict that I'm going to see cat? And if I do this for thousands of examples, I'm starting to learn what cat really means. Now, what we've done in my lab, we made a simple change. We said, well, maybe there isn't a generic cat. Maybe there is a way that different groups of people will look at cat. So we change this and say, we want to look at cat as spoken by Americans. So we focus on examples that come from American speakers. So now we start learning what cat means in this particular group. And with this, we started seeing other associations which will be reflected on the different groups. For instance, if we look at genders, if we look at expect, the, what we find that most strongly associated for male is nothing. For female, would be baby. <laughs> if we look at cultures, the most strongly associated word that we find for admit in India is being admitted to a hospital. In US is admitting guilt. <laughs> so now we started to form an idea of how language would be reflective of how we think about the world and also how we can use computational methods to start uncovering these associations, whether we have some context or whether we try to model words by themselves. Now, the other question that we ask is to what extent we can also use language to learn even more about people. And we looked at two different aspects. One has to do with perceptions of social roles and the other has to do with learning values. So for social roles, we focus on certain types of words that reflect the social roles in our society, such as, for instance, mother. So when I say the word mother, there are certain words that come to mind in terms of things that mothers would do. For instance, mother would love or care or cook. But then there are also certain attributes that come to mind. So again, when you say mother, there are attributes such as nurturing, lovable, or kind. We can do the same thing for other social roles. For instance, if I say policeman, there will be certain attributes that will come to mind and certain actions. And the same would be for friend. So a friend would generally listen and care and be honest and funny. So now we want to see if we can, again, take this, scale it up, and use computational methods applied on very large data sets to learn more about what are some of these perceptions of social roles in different groups. And to do this, we use syntactic parsing and syntactic understanding. So we look for relations between words. For instance, given a word such as mother, we want to see what are some of the adjectives that are more often used in conjunction with this word. And the same would go for verbs. So which are the more often used predicates in conjunction with mother? And then we also look at the semantic space. I mentioned before about how we can use neural networks or other algorithms to learn representations. This would allow us to put the words in a space and look at the semantic distance between them. So now putting these two together, I know there is the concept mother that I'm interested in and I want to learn more about. I know there are these words that form a attribute relation or an action relation. And then I can 
top, lay on top of that the semantic relations that I'm learning from these large semantic spaces from very large data sets, such as the hundreds of thousands of blog posts from US and India. And with this, we start learning new things. For instance, this is one of the words in our data set. So if you think of politician as a social role, it turns out there is quite a difference between how Indians would think about politicians versus how Americans think about politicians. So in India, if we look at the descriptors, so what are some of the attributes, adjectives that they think about, we will have words such as powerful, honest, influential. Now, if we ask Americans, that's a different story. We hear things such as dishonest, greedy, and corrupt. We've done the same thing for actions. What is that politicians do? And again, we see that in India, we have words such as speak, vote, and lead. Whereas in US, more common would be lie, campaign, and speak. So this is now telling us about how language will inform us about our perceptions of social roles. It's also telling us about some differences that exist between groups, or for that matter, also similarities. We can also even go one step farther and ask about the emotions that are associated with these words. And so we can look at the attributes or actions that we get from these responses, from these very large collections of text. And we see, for instance, that if we look at actions, um, in American responses, we'll more likely see emotions that are related to anger or fear for actions in particular, although in general, we'll see more often emotional responses coming from the Indian population. So the blue columns would be reflective of amount of emotions that we get from these responses, and then they to be quite a bit higher in Indian responses versus American. So with that, let me give you just one more example of what you can get from, from language. And this has to do with learning one's values. Another research project that we work on is to look at expressions of values. So if you think about your own values, you might say things such as being at peace with myself, honesty, faith in God, and so forth. So this speaks to one's values. And the question is, can we start understanding what are the values that are shared by one group? And the way we've gone about that, rather than starting in a top-down fashion and looking in psychology publications and finding what are values that are defined in such lexicons of values, we turn to people and ask people, what are the values that you think about when you are asked a question such as this? What are your top values? And getting hundreds and hundreds of such responses, we are able to compile them into a set of shared values for different groups. So for this, we use technologies that have to do with finding topics. So again, we convert all this linguistic data into numerical representations, which we can then put together and identify patterns with something such as matrix operations. And out of this, there will come certain topics that are associated with the groups. So for instance, we will see that there is mentions of hard work, family, problem solving, achievement, and so forth. The other thing that we can also do is to look at how these values are distributed in the two groups that we consider. So again, focusing on US and India, we see, for instance, that hard work is often mentioned by American as one of their core values, whether problem solving is more often mentioned by Indians. And again, this is all down in a bottom-up fashion. It's the data that speaks to us, as opposed to us imposing our own beliefs of what values should be. With this, I would like to wrap up, and I hope that I've convinced you there is a strong connection between words and people, that language is not only used for communication, but it's also used about telling others about ourselves. So language is really not only about words, but it's also about people behind language. Thank you.